Greetings, stranger. I see the rain has stopped, but night has now fallen, and there has also been a change of plan. Rather than continuing upriver all the way to Falcon's Hollow, I have decided to take us westwards along the river Arthrosh towards the town of Oregant. This is the capital of the Darkmoon Vale region of Andoran, and I feel it worthy of its own tour. From there we will continue overland towards the Darkmoon Wood, or simply the Woods, as Valers call it, resting in Falcon's Hollow before beginning the difficult trek up Droskar's Crag. I have decided to make this detour because, the more I think on the intricacies of the Vale, the more I realize that it would simply not do to condense its lore into a single exposition. I found this acceptable for Andoran's other regions because they offer comparatively little for the budding adventurer, but Darkmoon Vale is different. This rugged region contains everything necessary to begin one's career, an ancient haunted forest, a sprawling underground complex leading to lands deep and dark, conflict between humanoids and fey, and naturally an oppressive organization running the show. Who could ask for more? Thus this first instalment as we turn westwards will serve simply as an overview of the region, particularly its history and its peoples. I will refrain from describing Oregon, Falcon's Hollow or the Darkmoon Wood in too much detail, because each will be visited by us in person very soon to receive their own tours. Well, if that sounds agreeable to you, then let us begin. Detailed discussion of the history of a place like Darkmoon Vale would merit an entire series of lectures, for civilization here began long before the coming of humanity. After Earthfall wiped most surface folk off the face of Galarian and the Age of Darkness began, it became apparent to anyone remaining that beings beneath the crust would conquer the little that was left. So it came to pass that the Dwarves, united under their legendary King Targic, would undertake to fulfil their quest for Sky. They emerged from the Darklands in negative 4987 AR, and quickly established their mighty Sky Citadels in mountain ranges across the planet. The Five Kings range that marked the northern border of the Darkmoon Vale was privileged among these, however for it was here where King Targic himself first saw the depths of the bright blue sky. The Dwarf King's sprawling surface domains, remembered today as the glorious empire of Tar Targadth, would rule those mountains and their surrounding hinterlands until its collapse in 1551. Afterwards, various lesser Dwarf Kingdoms would oversee the Vale, though they paid it little attention. The largest and last of these kingdoms was the dwarven mighty kingdom of Tarhadun, which collapsed both politically and geographically with the great volcanic catastrophe called the Rending. On the 18th of Desnus, 3980, the great mountain called Torag's Crag violently erupted. Approximately the top thousand feet of elevation was slowed off the crest of the volcano and hurled across the surrounding lands as Lahars. The superheated rock and mud and ash buried everything it touched, and the Darkmoon Vale, being right on the southern foot of the crag, was deeply scarred. Most creatures living within the forest, for at the time the forest covered almost all of the Vale, suffered horrible deaths. The flora fared little better. Most of the trees that were not set aflame by the heat were simply toppled and swallowed up as a result of the accompanying earthquake. Some of the lava even found its way back into the fissures beneath the Vale, converting much of its water table into geothermal reservoirs and geysers. The displaced material also flooded the river foam, which runs eastwards through the Vale, and the water was sent into the countryside to ruin what little civilization had survived the initial destruction. At the time, Andoran was but a province of Cheliax, and humanity had not colonized Darkmoon Vale, for it was understood to be, in the first case, under the jurisdiction of Tahadum, and in the second, overrun with hostile fey and forest monsters. Yet in the aftermath of the rending, scouting parties were sent to determine what had occurred. They returned six months later, overjoyed, claiming that their two biggest obstacles to logging the darkwood trees were now removed, seemingly cleansed by Torax Crag. It took many years, over a century in fact, for the Vale to recover and for the political willpower to accumulate to fund a colonization effort, 
But finally, in the year 4113, Chelish general Karas the Falcon Novotnian led soldiers and adventurers northwards in conquest. They spent the next four years on campaign cleansing Darkmoon Vale of competitors, and the Empire formally recognized their efforts and declared Darkmoon Vale a barony within Andoran in 4117. The logging and lumber industries were not far behind. 22 years later, in 4139, the modern lumber consortium was established by Taris Rakesclaw of Oregon. Rakesclaw bought out the previous owner and injected new purpose into the ancient company, turning it from a humble, steadfast supplier of lumber to all Cheliacs into a ruthless, profiteering business focused on establishing and maintaining a lumber monopoly over the province of Andoran. Rakesclaw was alarmingly successful, and indeed the Lumber Consortium remains headquartered in Oregon today, as powerful as ever, despite Andoran's democratic independence as a nation. While simplified, this brief overview goes to demonstrate the critical importance of logging and the consortium to the Darkmoon Vale as a region of Andoran. Over 600 years or so of industry, the Darkmoon Wood, once indistinguishable from the larger Vale and Arthral Forest, has retreated to a relatively small expanse of pine, fir and duskwood trees clinging to the southern slopes of the volcano. Ulfden passed the torch to Oregon, which in turn deputized Falcon's Hollow as the staging ground for the consortium's cutyards. Many Valers believe, correctly in my estimation, that the Darkmoon Wood will be completely depleted within the next century if nothing changes, a fate that spells doom for the few Andorans who live in the Vale. A more optimistic perspective is to take the view that today, the Darkmoon Vale is more than its woodland. Indeed, its other geographical features remain almost untouched by the hand of civilization. Once you leave the Arthbell Forest from the north and enter the Vale, you will find yourself on the Dark Moon Plains. Unlike the Carpenden Plains to the east, no communities of farmers have migrated to tend the volcanic and quite fertile soils on account of the myriad geysers, hot springs and mud pits that riddle the earth. Few roads cross the landscape, and straying too far from them can spell death for an unprepared traveller. One false step on the Dark Moon Plains can send you plummeting into boiling water, scalding mud, or worse. Travelling northwards only intensifies the problem until you reach the slopes of the crag. Escaping westwards also offers little solace, for you then enter the territories owned by various Darklands factions guarding the entrances to the Candlestone Caverns, to which we will return shortly. Suffice it to say, they are none too fond of surface dwellers. Eastwards instead meets the Wolfron Hills, which might be an even deadlier decision. The Wolfron Hills have resisted civilization's march since the days of the Falcon's first expedition into the Vale, and are populated chiefly by wolves, therianthropes, and chimeras. The soil quality also drops rapidly, so there is little motivation to even the Lumber Consortium to expand into them. All this to say, the geography of the Darkmoon Vale is hostile to outsiders and to the unprepared. Explore it with enthusiasm, but pair it with the utmost caution. On the other hand, there have of course been successful attempts at settling the Vale. As the region's capital, Oregon sees the most traffic and trade. It is situated close to the foothills of the Nagortha Peaks along the river Arthrosh, which has doubtless salvaged its status after exhausting its vicinity of duskwood trees. We will discuss the settlement in more detail when the tour reaches it. The most active settlement in the region for lumber now is undoubtedly Falcon's Hollow, founded in the year 4574 by a trio of families loyal to the Lumber Consortium, it has served the organization as its tip of the spear, or axe if you prefer, faithfully, though not without difficulties both internal and external. Massacres, serial killings, kobold incursions, the meddlings of an especially powerful green hag, Falcon's Hollow has endured a lot in its brief history. The details of those will also be conveyed in a future tour. A settlement I can tell you about now is Ulfden, which is spelled like Wolfden but without the first letter, ostensibly some old joke about killing werewolves. It was founded in the year 4128 by one Berendo Novotnian, nephew of the great Chelish general. 
Located on the edge of the Arthfell Forest, about halfway between Falcons Hollow and Oregon, though a degree westwards of both, the town has a reputation for being sensible and cautious above all else. In fact, the locals have a saying whenever Falcons Hollow is mentioned, twice the size, half the excitement. They repeat this with pride, for the people of Ulfden have grown tired of the adventurous appeal of their homeland and wish to live in peace above all else. An eminently level-headed approach to life, I admit, and one doubtless brought about by constantly being called upon to deal with werewolves from the neighbouring shadow pack in the Arthfell Forest. Ulfden also benefits from the protection and oversight of the Diamond Regiment, a small unit of soldiers from Andoran's military commanded by a contingent of Golden Legion Eagle Knights. They base themselves in the Gleaming Tower Adamas, a white marble structure that was erected by the Falcon himself to serve as a campaign headquarters during Cheliax's pacification of the region. Because they are beyond the influence and authority of the Lumber Consortium, Ulfden enjoys relatively little interference from the Lumber Magnates. In terms of notable landmarks, Ulfden boasts few. Indeed, apart from the resplendent Hall of Sarenre, which is the largest temple anywhere in Darkmoon Vale, though this is not a particularly impressive claim, the most notable entities in town are its colourful cast of characters. In particular, I will mention the master chef Tobias Thrum of the Thrumming Birch Restaurant, whose menus change every month to offer a new assortment of animal limbs and meat cuts, and much more notably, one Watakshil, a shape-changing copper dragon who lairs in the Wolfron Hills, but lives day to day in Ulfden. Dragons are rare sights on Galadian, not because they are particularly uncommon, but because they are reclusive by nature. Among all the worms and dragon kin, though, copper dragons might be the most extroverted. Their boisterous nature often nudges them towards interacting with civilization, and for Watakshil, who first appeared in Ulfden in 4657 to defend the town from a werewolf attack, Darkmoon Vale is home. If you do go to meet him, you should know that he is often to be found in quite an inebriated state, claiming that alcohol calms his ever-quickened thoughts. Make of that what you will. My final point of interest this time is not a settlement at all, at least not to most humanoids. Located in the west of the Vale, close to the Aspidel Mountains, lie the Candlestone Caverns. Named for the enormous white stalactites that cling to the entrance's ceilings, the caverns were thought lost to history until a great earthquake shook the Vale in 4510. The stones and boulders that had sealed almost all of the entrances to the complex were removed, and its denizens were once again able to access the surface world in force. The caverns extend down through all of Narvoth and Sekamina, and terminate after 19 distinct levels with a road to the Midnight Mountains, one of the vaults of Orv, the deepest reaches of the Darklands. Along the way, though, a traveller must first deal with innumerable threats, including, but not limited to, troglodytes, dark elves, goblinoids, a ghoul sorcerer named the Skinless King, and even a very rare creature known as a Crystal Dragon. Delving past the entrances to the Candlestones removes you from any hope of Andoran support or rescue, more or less immediately. If you do choose to go to Dungeon Delve there, my advice would be to ensure you bring a source of light that is not the colour of fire, for the inhabitants of the caverns take it as a sure sign that outsiders are encroaching, and will ambush its source without mercy. Bring dulled blue or red hues to match the soft glow of the cavern's mushrooms or signals of beetles to avoid scrutiny. To the inhabitants of Darkmoon Vale, the Candlestone Caverns are little more than an endless series of caves from which kobolds endlessly flow. The top four levels are more or less under the control of a single, sadistic kobold tribe called the Black Claws. They dab their claws in spider venom as a coming-of-age ritual, which shortens their lifespans considerably but also renders them dangerous at close quarters. The Black Claws also happen to be excellent trap makers, even by kobold standards. A signature device of theirs is the Head Chomper, an envenomed, spiked metal cage that is affixed to the tops of rocks. 
Any larger creatures who bang their heads in the wrong place are ensnared in hideous fashion as the teeth puncture the neck, seeking to envenomate the carotid arteries. I shudder to think how many have died to these devices over the years. Make no mistake, the kobolds may dwell underground, but they have still claimed the surface hills surrounding all major entrances to the Candlestone Caverns, and their steadfast opposition to all surface life has left the northwest of Andoran difficult to navigate safely. Compared to the Black Claws, death by boiling geyser on Darkmoon Plain can almost seem pleasant. Well, stranger, that is a brief overview of the Darkmoon Vale. It is hardly the friendliest environment to inhabit, but through toil and dedication, life always finds a way. In the morning, we will reach Oregon and finally disembark. There is something about stretching one's legs on dry land that can never quite be replicated by the deck of a ship, so I am quite looking forward to it. In the meantime, we should get some rest. The night is dark here in the Vale, and you do not want to draw too much attention to yourself, even from the safety of a water vessel. Trust me. I will be in my cabin, consulting my tomes. I will see you by sunrise. Well, until then. <laughs>